Did you guys see that Joe Rogan had Stavos on? Stav Stavros? Anyway, uh, Stavros. He had Stavros on. And for those of you who don't know who Stavros is, uh, he was uh, pretty popular for an online podcast, which many of you are probably familiar with. But he's more recently known for a Netflix special that he released called Fat Rascal, which I saw on Netflix and I thought it was OK. I thought it was OK. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not going to sing it the highest of phrases, but I thought it was good. I mean, it was a it was a good thing to watch while I did some paperwork. I, it was OK. I, I, I don't want to blow it out of proportion, but yeah, it was OK. Anyway, he went on Joe Rogan's podcast. Joe Rogan also being a comedian, you know, I guess they were going on to talk comedy and all sorts of things. But eventually the topic of politics comes up, more specifically illegal immigration. And Stavros doesn't really agree that much with Joe Rogan here. And so once Joe Rogan starts laying it down like, oh, the illegal immigrants are coming over and they're taking all the services and they're doing this and they're doing that. And the Democrats are engineering, they're coming over so they can steal the vote. Look at this, look at that. And Stavros starts to respond to it. And I thought this back and forth was just very interesting how Stavros kind of walked around the conversation with them. So let's check it out. Video that was going around today of uh, people in Chicago that are furious that the government is giving so much money to uh, all these immigrants that are, have illegally migrated into Chicago. No, I didn't see that. They're giving them cell phone and 1200 yeah, yeah, bucks, yeah. whatever it is. And yeah. these people are fucking freaking out. Yeah. And you know, these people that were Democrats are like, yeah. hey, if Trump wants to talk to us, come talk to us. Like, <laughs> yeah, we're we're yeah, tired yeah, of this yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, wow, this, yeah. is, this is wild to see. And these people are waking up. Like, why are you giving people that aren't even from here all this money and a free phone and all this shit? You're not giving anything to us? I, and that, I mean, yeah, that is fucked. It's, it's like, fuck. I think. Those people deserve, but that's what it's like. We're seeing that's like, why aren't regular people getting that same shit? Why doesn't everybody just get that? Why are the fucking, why is that person getting special treatment where it's like, we're just fucked? I mean, well, that's the, they again, the safety net. They shit. shouldn't get it either. What they're doing is they're trying to buy votes. That's I what see, I think I they're see, doing. I see, I see. I try, they're trying to get rid of voter ID and they're trying to bring people in or well, allow those... people to get in and make it easy for them to travel all around the country. And if, if someone like let you in the country, wouldn't you vote for them? But they can't vote, can they? So I, 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 before before I let Stravos go on, I do just want to throw out there, uh, getting rid of voter ID has not been shown uh, tangibly to have had an impact on elections when it comes to voter fraud. The areas where you don't need voter ID to vote and you just go up there, you give them your name, you give them your address, and they allow you to vote, there hasn't been any tangible proof that by allowing that regulation Drought, uh, by uh, getting rid of that regulation, the amount of participants in fraud, people who are participating in fraud, trying to you know steal the election for their candidates, tangibly goes up really at all, and certainly not enough to have a tangible impact on elections. And so for me, I'm not necessarily against people having a voter ID. I do think if people are going to have a voter ID, that voter ID, whatever it is, should be provided free of charge to everyone once they turn 18 and they are registered to vote. I also think there should be automatic voter registration. I think there should be as few barriers between somebody and the vote as possible. And as long as they're a taxpaying citizen and they can make their way over to the voting booth, people should, up to election day, be able to register to vote and be able to participate in the elections. I think that we should be trying to encourage more and more and more people to vote, uh, to vote, participate in election, participate in democracy, and more people participating means our, elect, our elections and our government's gonna be more responsive to our interests and our democracy is gonna be more healthy. And so if my main interest right now is trying to get as many people to participate in elections as possible, and I don't have any evidence that voter ID is tangibly affecting voter fraud we're changing the outcomes of elections by beating back voter fraud and we're saving our democracy through this if i don't have any evidence that it's doing that then why put up an extra barrier between somebody and the voting booth especially since some states what is allowed voter id is different for example in some states uh, they'll be like okay yeah you know what you can use your student id you can use your 
other forms of identification. It's going to be a lot more wide span, really wide and sprawling the different types of voter ID that's allowed. While in other states, they're going to specifically say, oh, actually, the student IDs don't, aren't allowed. These IDs aren't allowed. You have to have this specific state issued ID if you're going to go to the voting booth and vote. And if you see what type of citizens have voter IDs of that style, a lot of times it's going to be older citizens, not younger citizens, which is going to tilt a certain way politically. If you look at the demographics, the demographics could tilt another way politically. And so for me, to just avoid any sort of even incentive to manipulate the system, just give voter ID to everyone once they turn 18, government issued, and be done with it. We address the right-wing concern about voter security and not having voter ID, and we address everybody else's concern about trying to make sure that everybody has access to the vote. Uh, but that solution has not been seriously considered. Uh, and I think a big reason why is because it's a lot of it's cynical. I think a lot of uh, this voter protections, uh, voter safety of uh, democracy when it comes to you need to put more and more regulations between the vote and the voting machine. I mean, the voter and the voting machine. I think it's less motivated by, say, the, uh, the security of our democracy. I think if it was uh, many of the same people pushing, it would probably not be backing the person who said he wants to suspend the U.S. Constitution and rejects the results of the 2020 election outright and would never accept a loss of any election, period, I think it's a lot more cynical. I think it's a lot more uh, uh, partisan. Well, what if they can? It's a, I mean, but they're talking about yeah, not yeah, having yeah. voter ID. But you have like, what do you think that they were talking about it in New York? They were going to try to make citizen? it so that you weren't a, if you weren't a citizen, you could still vote in New York. Interesting. That was something that was discussed, right? I don't know. Because my dad Google can't that vote. thing about New York. I think it was discussed, but I don't know that's so attempts to. I'm, I'm just I'm just thinking about all the students who go out thinking they're going to be able to vote. They give them their thinking, you know, like, okay, it's voter ID. They take out the student ID. They're like, hey, here's my ID. No, that's not allowed. You have to have this specific ID. And it's election day. It's too late for them to go out and get another ID. It's going to wait a month. Boom, that person's vote is now no longer counted. And why did we not count their vote? Why were they not included in the democratic process? Did, it, did not including them protect our democracy in any tangible way? have people that were immigrants capable of voting in New York, whatever you would search it under. But my dad straight can't vote and he's been here, you know, 40 years or 50, yeah, 40 something If they years. start changing things, look, why else would you want that many people to cross over? I would want those people to cross over if I was wanted one of two things. I wanted chaos or B, I wanted voters. Yeah. It's like, that's what like Wild well, Wild or, Country did. They brought in yeah, the homeless yeah, people. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same kind of but deal. But also, well, uh, Here. Oh, yeah. Struck down. Okay. State Supreme Court uh, judge from Staten Island said, uh, click on it so I can read it. So, State Supreme Court judge from Staten Island said the measure which would have allowed more than 800,000 non-citizens to vote violated the state constitution. So, they were trying to pass this measure. Imagine what, was that? what I, would I be the motivation? motivation. What would be the motivation of allowing people that or illegal aliens. Well, they're permanent legal vote. residents. Permanent legal residents. So they're basically like guys like my dad who've been So these here are just people. So this, this is something that was actually discussed in my city, uh, allowing uh, non-permanent legal, or, I mean, uh, allowing permanent non-legal residents to vote in the city. Uh, it did not succeed. It, it did get a majority of votes, but did not get enough votes necessary to change the city's constitution in order to allow those types of uh, that type of a change to allow non-citizens to be able to vote in city municipal elections. The logic behind the push to allow non-document, not non-documented, but non-permanent, not like people who aren't citizens, but have been living in the city for, say, 5, 10, 15 years and plan to live in the city for longer. Uh, the logic behind it is that they have a long term investment in the city's interest, uh, a long uh, a long term interest in the city's success. They've been living here for a very long time. Uh, allowing these people to participate in our elections allows them to uh, be allows them to be more responsive to any problems they have in the community, and it includes them. It's more inclusive of these people on a local municipal level. And uh, people make the legal argument that since it's not a federal election for say Congress or the presidency, it's not unconstitutional because many people are saying, "Hey, allowing non-citizens to vote." That doesn't seem like that's allowed, but uh, the argument and counter is this is a local election. This is a municipal election. This isn't a presidential election, so it doesn't necessarily need to come with a constitutional change. People that are not American citizens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. 
somebody with their green. I mean, some people never. Like I said, I don't think my dad is ever going to become a citizen. Also, only applied to local. So okay. non-citizens. What's the technical term for a non-citizen? If you're not a citizen and you're here, illegal resident. Illegal no, resident. No, legal, legal, legal. Yeah. So, do you have a green card? Yeah, green card. Forever? Green like, or is it? So. Does it expire? Age, age and residency requirements. Age and residency requirements. Yeah, so it's like I mean, look, you could debate that, but it's not the same as illegal immigrants. Like it's like people. It's the way the way it works is if you live in the city, and I mean, I'm, I don't know the specific New York circumstances. I'm just talking about what it was like in my city and what it's like from the other instances I've seen. How it usually works is if you've lived in the city for like 20 years and you're going to live in the city for another 20 years, then you can vote in the city elections because, hey, you're you're paying taxes, you're contributing to the city, you're you're, a, you know, you're working in the city, you live in the city, you should have some sort of say in how it's governed, even if you don't get a say in congressional elections or Senate elections or presidential elections. It's basically people mm -hmm. that have been in that place and they don't want to become citizens right. they could be able to vote for municipal elections not national elections but if you are a democrat or if you're a republican let's see yeah. it on the other side imagine you're a republican and you do this mm -hmm. and you say we're going to let people who aren't even citizens vote who do you think those people are going to vote for they're going to vote for the people that are allowing them to vote yeah just i mean you could make this argument for any group of people when it comes to uh, either you know the emancipate uh, not the word emancipation what's the word um enfranchisement you could use this argument to argue against the enfranchisement of any group of people. For example, when I debate D.C. statehood and the fact that, yo, know, these people should have, you know, they should have voting Congress people. They should have a senator that represents them. It does not make sense that they have non-voting people in the House of Representatives, just an observing member. That's not fair. That's not democracy. That's not what this country was founded upon. The principles which we all agree we should all hold. And when I get pushback... It becomes very partisan. It's yes, but if we allow the state, and this is from the Republican strategic perspective, if we allow the Democrat, uh, the Democrats that controls uh, D.C., which is what will happen if it becomes a it becomes a state, they're going to have two Democratic senators and a bunch of Democratic House members because the city leans like ninety percent Democrat. Uh, what's going to happen is that's two extra Democratic senators, and that's more leverage to the Democrats in the Senate. And a, a slightly more leverage for the Democrats in the House when the tie, when the when the you know the lines between House control and Senate control are so narrow, do they really want to give that to the Democrats? Even if on principle, if it was a different situation, I bet you can convince many of them to support D.C. statehood or some sort of uh, representation for the people of D.C. But because of the current political circumstances and which side of the political aisle D.C. ends up on when it comes to his voting base, uh, there's just there's just no way they're going to support it anytime soon. Especially if you're not politically savvy. Now, it is kind of like now, if, if, if I, I think a much stronger argument for Joe would not just be, well, they're going to vote for the Democrats if the Democrats say, hey, we should allow them to vote. I mean, anybody that's saying, I don't think this group should vote, and the other group says, I believe this group should vote, if you're a part of that group, odds are, if you listen to those two positions, you're going to say, hey, one of these two sides believes I should vote. And so I'm going to uh, support, I'm going to back, and I'm going to finance the side that believes I should vote. Yes, that's understandable. That's still not an argument as to why they shouldn't vote in local municipal elections. I could process and i could respond to an argument closer to i believe that voting is a responsibility of citizens i believe it is something that determines the future of the country to the future of the state it determines uh you know how much taxes we pay it determines who we go to war with it determines so much and if you're not willing to tie yourself to the country through citizenship or you haven't gone through the due legal processes of doing that uh, you haven't done enough investment into the country you haven't tied yourself enough to the country for me to say, yes, you should be able to vote. That's something I can respond to. That's something I can tangle with because that is separate from just the argument of, well, if you say someone should be able to vote, that person is more likely to support the person that said they should be able to vote. Well, of course, that'd be true for any cause of enfranchisement for any group of people. 
it's like fucking Tammany Hall, like in Gangs of New York, where it's like you vote like four times and then right. just bring the fucking Irish people <laughs> off the boats and like put a, shave your mustache and go vote again, like that kind of shit. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of that. Well, that's the old. Yeah, that's how it always used to be. That's how they always did it. But um, but the thing is, it's like if you wanted the laws on voting to be more lax and you wanted citizens yeah. that are here but they're not legal they're not right you could early that's but or not legal or not, yeah, that's yeah. next i don't think you'd be able to get anybody to fucking go how for that. are you trying to get people to vote for someone who's not a citizen voting well that's always been the thing like you cannot vote if you're not a citizen there i guess just reading off that right i don't know anything right. else that to me i don't know that i would have to think about it but it's like what they're what they're saying is if you've been here a while you're a legal resident mm -hmm. you're part of this community you pay right. taxes you do all that stuff you can vote in local municipal elections you can't vote for fucking senator you can't vote for fucking president mm -hmm. you can vote for alderman you can vote for fucking state house representative because point. they directly affect your thing which is at least a reasonable argument as opposed to a non-citizen can have the full legal protection see i you know this is the thing about about joe rogan the first thing is it's good that he has comedians on that can push him in a direction that he's not getting from a lot of the political commentators that he's hanging around with and what i mean is joe rogan cares about comedy a lot he goes to comedy clubs a lot. He is a comedian, considers himself a comedian. He considers himself um, in, in like deep in comedian culture. So it's good for him to have somebody who is a comedian, who cares about a craft and of art form that he cares about uh, being able to give him some sort of pushback against the political commentators that he surrounded himself with. So that's the first thing. So it's good that it's coming from a, com a comedian. The second thing I want to push out there it is also good to see Stra Stravos, while not being that, you know, aggressive, not bullying, not getting angry, not, I don't want to say acting like Chank, right? But I think Chank is a great example of, you know, of trying to channel some level of rage, uh, rage and outrage about an issue that cares about you and directing it towards someone or directing it towards a story. Uh, he took his time to just walk with him towards the end of this of, around the story and what the implications of this uh, voting non-citizens voting uh, legislation would actually entail uh, what what's the uh, result that uh, Joe Rogan thinks they're aiming for which is the capturing of our democracy versus what's versus what's actually happening in actuality and what other motivations could be at play because what you don't need is to disprove that anybody could possibly have cynical interests in trying to have non-citizens vote that's not something that Stravos can disprove. What Stravos can do is add nuance to as uh, as to why the motivations exist for introducing this in the first place and what exactly the purpose of this legislation is. Because once you hear like non-citizens voting, they're trying to make it so non-citizens can vote. Then you get this like Senate election, 1948. 1949 it's like 1950s and they're just getting people across the border into texas flying them across and then having them vote at the voting booth for whatever candidate you want because you just want to rig it and and that's how that's how elections are done down south in the 50s that's the image people get in their mind when they hear non-citizens voting but when you add the context of oh you have to live there for like 20 years well that seems like a hell of a lot of a commitment doesn't it you move somewhere, live there for 20 years as a legal citizen, by the way, in order just to, you know, help the Democrats. And see, see once you add this context, the fear mongering, the, the hyperbolic uh, image of the story that people had in their mind of like the ghost of LBJ bussing over a bunch of Guatemalans across the border to vote in the Texas elections to turn Texas from from red to blue. Once that image melts away. And it's, oh, it's it's that guy who's been living down the street for 25 years as a legal resident who has been working as a mechanic or working as a teacher or working as a tech specialist. Oh, they're going to be able to vote for county councilor. I think this, this type of de-escalation of the rhetoric, or at least the image that is being produced of, of, of what's going on in the country to get people riled up, which is why I think part of the reason why I probably captured Joe Rogan's attention, I think is really, really good. It's a fantastic effect. Especially when we have the uh, great replacement theory being pushed more and more and more by people on the Republican presidential campaign trail, on Tucker Carlson show, and on other platforms as well.
So, so it's good to have one of the most popular podcasts get some pushback on this theory.